Hi you 12, uh, so this is the video on uh, Bill Bryson's Neither Here Nor There Travels in Europe and just like the On Paris video it is going to be a bit longer than the poetry ones so you'll need to bear with, maybe get like a little cup of tea or something for when you annotate. So I'm going to start by looking at the contextualisation um, on the uh, first page of contextualisations. Uh, here we go. So, uh, Bill Bryson is an American author who has written a number of travel memoirs as well as popular books on science and languages. Neither here nor there, Travels in Europe tells the story of his journey through Europe in 1990. The chapter on Paris includes memories of an earlier trip he made to the city in the 1970s. So, that hints at an important kind of like dual narrative. So, he's going to be, there's going to be um, analepsis, flashbacks to the 70s when he was in Paris before. Maybe he'll be doing some comparison of how Paris has changed in that 20 year period. And also what's important is that he's not just visiting Paris like lots of the other writers. He's traveling in Europe. So he may be comparing Paris to other European cities that he's been to. So his frame of reference for the way that he describes the city sounds like from this contextualization would be quite different to a lot of the others. Um, he, what it doesn't say here is um, that he's known as a comic writer. So he does write on um, popular books, uh, sorry, popular topics like science and languages. Um, he's written a brilliant uh, book called Mother Tongue. Um, but he's, the way he writes is, is quite funny. So what you will um, see slash have seen is that a lot of this is infused with humour. So as you did with the last one, if you haven't read this recently, as in like, in the last five minutes. Can you pause the video and read the text? It's not the shortest one, it's about seven or eight pages, but it's quite a quick read because it's um, it's quite kind of simply written. So pause the video and read it if you haven't done already, and then uh, we're going to get into some annotation. Okay, so um, you will have seen just from rereading it there that it is kind of uh, it's, it's intended to be humorous. So I'm just going to fill in my um, AO3 at the top here. So the purpose is to entertain. And this is kind of secondary purpose of informing us about his travels and what he sees when he's in Paris. Uh, the genre is that it is a travel memoir. So we're into this new genre of memoirs. And this is a kind of um, sub-genre of that, where it's not just a memoir of some of time you've spent in your life, but time specifically spent travelling. So if you think back to the text French Milk, this is similar to that in the sense that it's um, a memoir of time spent travelling through a city. Uh, the mode is obviously written. And the register we will see from reading it is pretty medium. He writes in quite a casual, conversational way. And that is partly because of the relationship he's trying to build with his audience. The humour and the informality make Bryson seem really familiar to the reader. And that's part of um, how he's ended up with such a huge fan base over the years. Um, so the text producer is Bryson. Um, important things to note about him is that he's from the United States so he's got that perspective um, and he's also done a lot of travel writing so we talked about that dual narrative coming up. Now who would be reading this? Well his fans, he's got a really devoted fan base so there are people who maybe have no intention of ever going to Paris that would read this anyway, maybe they've never even been to Europe um, if they're from the States perhaps. Um, but they love his writing, so they would read his work. Um, so other travellers as well, maybe people who are travelling through um, Europe, or travellers. Um, but not people I don't think that are planning a trip to Paris, because remember, this is a book about his travels through Europe, so you would be buying the whole book just to read that one section. So if you were just going to Paris, you're more likely to look at one of the guide books. Um, or look at one of the adverts um, rather than reading this. So this is more fans and travellers, people that understand his writing and his references. So uh, we've got our context um, made clear there 
and what you'll have seen from reading as I just said was how important the purpose of entertaining is um, and part of how he does that is he focuses a lot of his description in this extract on people so uh, the way that Parisians seem different to either Americans, he compares them to British people as well, he also compares them to some different nationalities in Europe, there's a paragraph where he kind of compares the reputations of Parisians, Italians, I think Germans as well. So a lot of what I'll be focusing on is how he's entertaining us by describing the people. And with that in mind, I'm going to pick out something from the end of this first paragraph to start with. So he's talking about Paris waking up and he says, uh, Then all at once it's frantic. Cars and buses swishing past in sudden abundance. Cafes and kiosks opening. People flying out of the metro stations like flocks of startled birds. Movement everywhere. Thousands and thousands of pairs of hurrying legs. So there's something in the description here um, that I like. And I'm going to start... The correct way this time, last time when I was annotating, I kept going in on AO1 first, which is a bad habit. And to go in on AO4, what is the representation first and how do I know that? Well, this is quite a chaotic representation, I think. So I'm going to go in with um, Paris's chaotic. So that's my AO4, which is, oh gosh, is that yellow? Yes, it is. How could I forget? Paris is quite chaotic. How do I know that? Well, there's two things. So there's the simile, like flocks of startled birds. But also, this description here, thousands and thousands of pairs of hurrying legs. So, um, the simile, like flocks of startled birds, that should immediately be making you think of the Hemingway we looked at last time. So the um, description of people as kind of animalistic in a way, um, even though Hemingway was actually talking about the Americans in Paris and here, if it's people coming out of metro stations and going on their way to work, it's like the Parisians. Um, so the simile, and then also this description. So remember when you, dis when you break um, something down to like an individual part to describe the whole, that's a metonym. So he's using metonymy, which is a type of metaphor, which is a type of figurative language. This is all quite similar. So he's using the simile. He's also using the metonym. To create this chaotic description. And if you simply say that he's combining these two techniques, you're identifying a pattern in language use. So remember to keep that at the forefront of your mind. So why represent it like that? Um, I think for this I'm going to go with something about saying that he is, this is all quite foreign to him, he is an outsider isn't he? He is from the US, he is not French, it's all quite different to him. So I'm going to say that this seems quite foreign to him, so he's finding a way of describing how different it is perhaps to the commute uh, where he's from in the United States. So I'm going to say that text producer is foreign, so he's making it sound quite different. And as you're like obviously developing your confidence of doing these texts, if you want to do a different, these are just suggestions of, of the AO3 that you could link it to. But remember, as long as you're across your annotations, linking to all these different bits of the context, you can make different individual links for different individual examples. I'm just doing what seems kind of um, most uh, straightforward to me. Okay, so we've got kind of chaotic representation of Paris and the people in Paris, the commute in Paris. Um, and that is kind of um, extended to an extent throughout what he's writing, because he moves on and spends quite a lot of time, as you will have seen, talking about driving conditions in Paris and how busy it is and how kind of, well, frantic to use his adjective there, how frantic it is and how the, the traffic is quite chaotic. And this is down here in the second paragraph, you get quite a, ch a kind of typically Bryson-esque phrase. Uh, so I mean to say, here you have a city with the world's most pathologically aggressive drivers. He uses a lot of hyperbole to describe and it's often hyperbolic 
through the adverb and adjective combination, so pathologically aggressive. So um, I'm going to start on my AO4, and I'm going to say that this makes the people of Paris, the Parisians, sound mentally unstable, which is something that he does a lot. And as I said, we get that through this combination of the adverb and the adjective, creating hyperbole. Because that adjective, that sorry, that adverb and particularly pathologically, is what suggests that it is not. It is something within their makeup, their kind of DNA that creates this pathology, creates this way of mind. Um, so it's not almost not a choice, it's just the way they are, it's part of their DNA. Um, and I'm going to link this to his purpose. He's trying to make us laugh, he's trying to uh, create some humour because his purpose is primarily to entertain us. So I'm going to link that to the purpose of entertaining. And what I'm now going to do is find another example that supports this point, because there are quite a few. Um, you could simply look further down here um, in this uh, description. Drivers who in other circumstances would be given injections of Thorazine from syringes the size of bicycle pumps and confined to their beds with leather straps. So that is some imagery that recalls um, the kind of classic image of like a... Um, uh, an asylum or um, uh, a, a ward in a, um, a mental health hospital with the leather straps and the idea of this um, Thorazine I believe is a sedative so the hyperbole and the syringe the size of bicycle pumps I think makes a good supplementary point a supplementary quote to this one so they work nicely together again building up that image. You could also add in the leather straps as well. Okay, So all three of those work together nicely to create this AO4 representation. Um, and I would just call this an image. And yes. Um, you could say that together this is the semantic field of mental illness. So the syringe, pathologically, leather straps. So I'll add that on there. Hyperbole, adverb and adjective, semantic field of, um, what did I just say? Mental, mental health? I think yeah, that's what I said. Okay, so, so far he's been really hyperbolic. He's described the prisons as being very kind of uh, chaotic um, and being in Paris as an experience which is quite um, uh, quite nerve-wracking, quite frightening in a way if you were to imagine that driving. And then he continues on by focusing on people in this paragraph and he makes one of those comparisons that I said. So he's describing the, um, the way that different nationalities are uh, stereotyped. So the Italians is voluble, meaning they talk a lot unreliable and hopelessly corrupt. The Germans is gluttonous, the Swiss is irritatingly officious and tidy, and the French as well, insufferably French. So I'm gonna take that description and explore that a little bit. So my, uh, how did people in, in, in Paris come across? Well, we need to focus on this final bit for that. The French is insufferably French. That, if you don't know what French people are like, that description doesn't make any sense, does it? Because he's used the word he's trying to describe in the description, which suggests that Bryson finds the French difficult to understand and therefore difficult to explain to other people. So he's kind of um, searching around for a description and they're almost, un they're almost indescribable, aren't they? Because he just says, well, they're just French. So um, the representation of the French is that they are uh, indescribable, 
yet irritating because they're insufferable. So I'm just going to make that clear. Uh, French people are indescribable yet irritating. And I'm going to zoom in on insufferably French. So he's done that thing again where he's used quite a hyperbolic adverb. But what he's also done is used the proper noun French. Um, yeah, proper noun and adjective, depending on how you use it. But he's used it as an adjective here, which suggests that being being French isn't just about your nationality. It infuses the way you behave and it is almost like a characteristic in itself. So hyperbolic adverb and adjective in French. And yeah, he's suggesting that they are just a little bit like saying it's a pathological thing it's in their DNA. The being from France and being from Paris makes them behave in this way. So it makes them indescribable yet irritating. Um, what am I going to link to AO3 wise? Um, I think I'm going to take this whole description and I'm going to link to the fact that he is writing a travel memoir. So part of what he's doing is making comparisons between the different places that he has been to help people understand his experience. So I'm going to link this into the genre a travel memoir and part of the purpose of that memoir is to compare so what you could do you compare experiences what you could do then is look at if you were going to make this point pull in some of this evidence from up here to compare so all these adjectives that he's using so gluttonous officious unreliable corrupt, voluble. They're all very dismissive, aren't they? Um, he's not pulling his punches. He's trying to be, again, for the point of being humorous, for the purpose of entertaining, he is using dismissive adjectives to create this picture of Europeans as really quite irritating all in their own way, but the French particularly so in a way that he can't even, this brilliant writer, um, can't even quite grasp the words to describe. Okay, so he um, he does talk about, he, he focuses a lot on the people, you'll see as, as it goes on, he starts to talk about his travel companion that he was with called Katz, um, but he does spend some time talking about the city itself, albeit not that much, um, and it, he focuses on things to do with the driving in this section. So there's just like a short a metaphor, which I think is quite interesting in this paragraph. So he's remembering a time when uh, he was in Paris before on his honeymoon. So we've got some analepsis. And I'm, I'm just going to annotate that down here, actually. And he describes being uh, trying to cross the road and ending up in the middle of a roundabout. And he describes it as being stranded in the midst of a circus maximus of killer automobiles. So uh, it's past tense. It's um, what was analepsis. I'm going in with my AO1 rather than my AO4. Bad habit. So back to AO4 before I go on to the AO1. Um, a circus maximus is um, kind of from Roman times, like the gladi gladi gladiatorial. Do you say that? Gladiatorial, gladiatorial, whatever that adjective is. Gladiatorial arena, uh, where they used to to kill one another. So he's again using his trademark hyperbole to make us laugh, but he's using a reference from history that his audience is likely to know. And what is the representation? What am I starting with? Well, it makes Paris sound like a death trap. So I think if you were to get this text, it would